Good morning. This is the Oakmont Sunday Symposium, and we are delighted today to have Megan Waller-Murphy as our speaker. Um, Megan graduated from UC Santa Cruz with a biology focus and somehow has turned that into becoming one of the experts in this area on tracking animals and the ecology that goes along with wildlife. And then in turn, she's become the expert on bears. And I never thought we would actually see bears in Sonoma County, but they're here now. So Megan, tell us all about them. Okay, right. well, thank you, George, for the introduction. And thank you, Oakmont community. Welcome on this, what is it, Sunday morning? I guess we'll be watching this. And um, yeah, just a quick background of myself. I'm a wildlife ecologist and have spent at least the last 22 years tracking animals and um, not so much with GPS collars and telemetry, but literally following their footprints. And um, I have followed a lot of my passions into tracking bears. And I'm now the lead coordinator on the North Bay Bear Collaborative, which we'll get into a little bit later. And I'm really thrilled and excited and thankful that you're willing to spend the next half hour to hour with me and um, your neighbors learning about bears in our neighborhood. And I'm just going to share our screen and then we'll get going. Great. Can you all see that screen? Just to make sure. Great. Thank you, George. Well, I really love starting with this slide. This was from a time when I was working in Yellowstone and this is a mama bear just right off the road. And it was very early in the morning, maybe like 4.30 or five in the morning, the sun was just rising. And I was watching her and her cubs play. And then she kind of just sat back and sat down and these two little baby cubs just crawled up on her chest and started nursing. And I was amazed that she was so close to the road and um, to my vehicle to allow that to happen. And I really started to think about why? Why would she do this so close to the road? And the more and more that I have learned about wildlife over the past you know, 20 plus years and spent time with bears is that they are incredibly intelligent and animals have figured out how to live with humans sometimes a lot faster than we have figured out to live with them. And she chose to be next to the road because it keeps her safe. It keeps her safe from other predators that might be coming close um, and allows her to keep an eye out because usually close to the road, it's clear. But the other thing I learned from this um, kind of event and experience was that bears are, have good boundaries. So she was sitting there and the two little cubs were nursing and then they must have gotten their fill and they kind of started to tussle with each other while they were nursing. And one of them must have nipped her too hard and she kind of cuffed it on the side of the head and, and didn't stop them from playing with each other. And she, you could hear her growling at these cubs and um, they still didn't stop. And so she just stood up and these two little cubs rolled off her chest and down the hill. And I was like, oh, good parenting and um, great boundaries. She's really clear in her communication. And as we kind of go through this journey of learning and being with bears, and um, that's one of the things that I really love about bears, their communication is exceptional and dynamic. And if we learn to read their signals, very, very clear. So here we go. Um, as George was saying, I have excuse me, tracked and worked with lots of wildlife all around the United States, but a lot in Southern Africa and Brazil and Mexico um, and Canada. And bears have grabbed me like no other animal. And the very first time that I was really intrigued by them was when I started to learn about these things called step-by-step -step trail. They also have um, other names called like traditional trails or, or ancestral trails. And basically what happens with these trails, and you can see it in their like deep footprints in these photos, is that generations of bears will teach cubs to step in the exact same footprints that all the bears preceding them have stepped in. And it's amazing. So if you're a big bear, they have videos where big bears will shorten their stride to make sure they're fitting in the steps. And if they're little bears, you'll see the little bears really stretch out to make sure they're stepping in the exact same steps of other bears and when they do step they actually like pop their elbows out so they're really pushing impressions and then they twist um, their feet and what i love about it is it's kind of a mystery there's no 
real understanding about why they do it. Some people suppose maybe it's a trail to food and back, but it happens all year round. It's not just seasonal for foods. And some people say it's for reproduction. But what I do know is that when I have come upon these, and I found maybe half a dozen, um, and I have found some in California, is that it has that same feeling of when you're looking at a great piece of art, or you go into a temple or a church and there's a quiet that falls over in a hush when you're seeing something um, really beautiful. And when you find these kind of step-by-step -step traditional trails, there is a hush and a quiet that falls over the land. And so the very first one that I was ever in, I was blown away and I was like, what are these bears? What are they doing? Um, and I want to know more. And I was completely hooked. And that was about 15 years ago. Um, and so here we go. So most of these photos, and maybe you can follow my cursor, um, the, the four photos that are on the top and bottom and center are black bears. And that is the bear that we have um, in California and certainly in Sonoma County. But traditionally, California was predominantly a grizzly bear state. In this top left photo, this is a grizzly bear mama and her two cubs. Um, and Sonoma County, up until about 100 to 150 years ago, had way more grizzly bears than they did black bears. This is grizzly bear country. And then through a series of hunting and extirpation, um, poisoning, we had caused the extinction of grizzly bears in most of the continental US and certainly in um, Mexico as well. Grizzly bears went all the way down into central Sonoran, um, the state of Sonora in Mexico. So the darker orange in this slide is kind of where grizzly bears are now. The range is expanding a little bit more into Idaho, um, but you can see the lighter yellow, all of California was covered in grizzly bears. And as I said, through a really um, very, very focused, intentional hunting um, and extirpation practice, the California grizzly is now extinct. And the only place we see it is on our California flag. But what's happened and what we believe is going on is with this vacuum that's been created by the extirpation of grizzlies, black bears are starting to move in. And there were, historically, um, it is told that there were black bears in Sonoma County, but they were really pretty much um, relegated to the northwest part of the county, like Stewart's Point, Annapolis, Wallala area, and most of Sonoma County um, in its dry grasslands and oak woodlands and chaparral was grizzly country. But now that the grizzlies are gone and kind of not protecting those bases, we believe that the black bears are filtering in. Um, and Mendocino and Humboldt counties have some of the highest densities of black bears anywhere in the US and certainly in California. So we believe that the bears are kind of this dispersing down the state and, and into Sonoma County because who doesn't want to live here? We have good food, we have compost, we have bees, we have orchards, we have grapes, we have all kinds of really good stuff. It's a foodie county and the bears are like, yes, thank you. Um, but really, we don't know where they're coming from. And I like to share with people, to me, um, I always wished I could have been like an explorer and a new frontier, but studying these black bears in Sonoma County is a little bit like that for me. They haven't been here. It's a new relationship with a landscape that they haven't lived on. And right now, no one has studied them. So I'll get into it a little bit more later, but the North Bay Bear Collaborative is really opening this gateway of understanding black bears in the Bay area um, and it's super exciting and it is a, a question of exploration so you may have as I said questions later and I'll be like I don't know we don't know yet but I'll give you my best guess um, here's a graph that's from California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, the most recent is from 2016 but you can see that there's a steady increase of black bears in California and we're somewhere between 35 and 45,000 black bears in California we don't know how many there are in Sonoma County. Um, and when I first moved to Sonoma County from Southern California, I have spent my whole life living in the coastal mountains of California. Um, I moved up here in 2012 and bears were like, oh no, maybe we have them. But literally within the first year that I lived here, about half a mile from my house, right at Coleman Valley and Joy, where they come together, a black bear was seen. And it was big news. Um, and Jim Coleman of Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, you know, sent out this email and had taken this photograph of this dispersing 
Mayo Bear. And I really just love this quote and want to share it with you. I'll give you just a minute to um, read it. But I really appreciate this idea that our freezers and our fridges and our outdoor compost are a greater part of the ecology. Um, and it's humbling to realize the bears are not separating, oh, that's human food, I'm not gonna touch it. They see it as food and they're like, yes, thank you. Um, and this specific bear, I believe, was responsible for drinking like 20 gallons of fish emulsion that OAC had for um, their gardening purposes. So they are here um, and we should be humbled by them. They have been neighbors uh, to North America and uh, certainly the Northern Hemisphere for all of human history and lots and lots of human cultures have learned to live with them and it's our chance to remember that. So recently bear sightings have become the norm. Um, it's pretty exciting. They, every year we get to see them and certainly maybe some of you have heard about the bear that is in Sonoma Mountain right now and the bears that are in Sugarloaf, but it is the norm and this is the season right now, May, June, July, of bear dispersal. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Oh, I just need this over. Sorry, my, um, I'm a little technical, there we go. So um, here's just a slide to give you an idea of what they look like. Their color ranges from black to blonde. They're even up in Canada, blonde bears. Um, I'm sorry, blue bears, they say. I haven't seen one. I'm kind of excited to see one at some point. Um, and the males can be quite large, up to 500 pounds. The females range out around 250 pounds. And they have a long lifespan. So once they're in your neighborhood, they may be there to learn from and to um, teach us a lot of things. Uh, I don't think that this is gonna work. These were two black bears that um, I had was watching when I was in Yellowstone. And I bring this up because really people are like, well, what are they eating? And are they carnivores? And are they gonna eat my pets? Black bears are amazing um, vegetarians. A large percentage of their diet is plants and grubs. And uh, this was a video, I don't know if it's gonna play right now, um, of these bears just grazing and grazing and grazing in this landscape. Um, and they just eat a lot of grass, kind of amazing. And here is a track and sign of these bears. Often, you know, we really want to get those really great, beautiful, clear tracks. But here, um, you can see it's really vague. If you can follow my cursor, this is uh, the foot pad of a front foot, and then here are the toes. These are like, oh, it's kind of a nice track, but it's not great. And then you really hope for these tracks when you're out there looking at them. Um, they're deep. They have great impressions, they're in really good mud. And to understand um, a bear track, they do have five toes just like us. And if everyone would just focus on your feet for a minute and now move your big toe in your shoe, your sock, whatever it is, and become really aware of your big toe. And now I want you to imagine moving your big, to big toe to where your pinky toe is. That's where the big toe is on a bear. The big toes of bears are on the outside of their feet. Um, which you know can be confusing if you're trying to figure out right and left. They also um, leave very subtle sign. For being an enormous animal, it's hard to see them. You think, oh, their tracks are no problem. Uh, this is a good friend of mine, Lisa Moulton. We were up at Modini Mayakama Preserve, and a big bear had walked through this grass. And I just wanted to have her stand in that photo to show us um, she's pointing at bear tracks. And what's really interesting is that when bears are moving through grass, they often look like human trails. And we'll see some of that. And um, this was a different day. This was actually last year, April. Um, and you can tell by the green up, it was before it was really hot and we had a lot of rain last year. And I had picked up this bear trail and you can see, um, if you can follow my cursor again, here's the front left foot, here's the front right foot, um, hind right foot and hind left foot. So the bear has made this really nice box stop. And then you can see right here is a big giant scat. So one of the amazing things about tracking is you can imagine the animal in its tracks doing what it does. And because I'm a geek and I like scat and if you get into tracking, you really look at a lot of poo and shit. Um, so right over here on the, um, on the right is this big blown up scat. And it was mostly filled with grass. 
and this bear had been eating grass for hours and hours. And then I followed this bear out and you can see this is just what a human trail would look like um, if humans were walking through deep grass. And I kind of challenge you to go out and walk through deep grass and look at your own trail and you'll get an idea of what these bear trails look like. So I kept following this bear and we followed it to a bathtub. Um, and there's a lot of bathtubs out in the wild country because people have put them out there as cattle troughs and then they've just left them out there. But when rains come, they fill with water and bears love to get into water and bathe. Um, and what was so great is that this bathtub was on a hillside and when you looked out into the distance, it was like you could see Pepperwood and Healdsburg and the Santa Rosa Plain. It was the most amazing view. And this bear got into the bathtub um, and you can see this arrow is pointing at basically this mud. I tried to get a better shot, but this is the muddy hair tracks of the bear. And he got in there um, and wallowed around. And I do know it's a big male bear because we've gotten photos of this bear and got in and muddied around a little bit and then got back out. And, and we followed him for probably another hour before he hit a paved road and we lost the trail. So there's bears are incredible to follow. Um, really interesting, funny creatures. They eat a lot of the same things that we eat, which makes them really interesting. I have learned um, different foods that I can eat by watching what the bears are eating. At this top right, you can see is filled with grass. The bottom are pin cherries, which are great wild food that do grow. Um, well, they certainly grow in the coastal mountains in Southern California. I'm not sure if they're in Sonoma County or not. Bears don't have great digestion, so a lot of what comes in goes right back out. So that makes them amazing seed dispersers. This was a bear that I was uh, tracking two years ago that was walking down in Stony Point Road in downtown Santa Rosa, and it hooked a right on the Santa Rosa Creek Trail. And it's actually right about this time that I was trailing. And if you look at the plum trees, those kind of cherry plum trees, there's all these unripe plums in this so I feel for this bear because it was probably a young bear trying to figure his way out and freaked out in the city and, and was eating a lot of these plums that were unripe. And you can see they're just like wet, loose things. So I was just, oh, the poor bear and his indigestion. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, friend. Um, and left these scats all up and down the trail until it hit over um, in Sebastopol and the Laguna de Santa Rosa. And maybe they don't know where that bear is now. Bears really eat a lot of insects too. This is great bear sign. Um, they will come up to rotten logs and get their claws in there and pull them out and then eat the larva and the grubs and whatever it is that they can find. Um, and they do eat carrion. They are not amazing hunters. They're not very fast. Well, they're fast if they need to be, um, but they don't chase animals down. Mountain lions are incredible hunters. They're stunning, beautiful animals to watch them stalk and prey. A bear is an opportunist. Um, bears follow their noses and this bear, this is in, again in Yellowstone, and this bear found a young bison that a wolf pack had taken out. Um, so they will eat carrion. If they can catch the occasional fawn that has just been dropped by um, her mother, then they might do that. But um, as I said, they're not amazing hunters of big game. They will eat voles and um, small rodents if they can catch them as well. So black bears, um, they have an incredible relationship with trees. While grizzlies were bears of the open country and grasslands and chaparrales, black bears are forest bears and um, they love trees. And this is a picture of Aspen and you can see on the left, um, this is bear feeding sign, the bears are put their claws into the trees and they basically just pull themselves up the trees like a lot of young kids do. Um, and so you'll see a lot of feeding sign. They're getting up there to eat the buds of trees. If they find a nest, they'll eat what's in the nest as well. But they also, and this kind of goes back to where I started with their just amazing communication. Bears use trees for communication um, and uh, a lot of scent marking. So this, this is um, Ginny Fifield and my friend Preston Taylor. They are both extraordinary wildlife folk. And we are again out in um, the Mayacamas and this is a Sergeant Cypress. And what this bear has done is gone and torn the top off the Sergeant Cypress. Um, and you can see right here in the bear part on the left, the bear bark part on the left, um, this bear has kind of torn the bark off of the tree. 
And I don't know if you've ever had a chance to be around a sergeant cypress, but they have this incredible smell. So if you've ever heard um, bears have like, I think it's, I'm not very good with number memorization, maybe at least 10 times, but maybe 50 times better smell than a hound dog. They will use trees to release smells to attract other bears to them. Um, and so sergeant cypress has this really poignant smell. And what's remarkable and this kind of goes back to the exploration piece, is we're seeing the bears in Sonoma County targeting sergeant cypress trees because of the smell. And in different regions, bears use different trees to get their message across. And over here, Preston is holding the top of the sergeant cypress back on this stump. Here again is another sergeant cypress that was hit. This is Stephen Hamrick from Pepperwood Preserve. Um, and again, he's holding the top of the tree that the bear literally just broke off um, as a sign and signal. And this is an up close version of what Steve was holding. You can see that there's clear, uh, claw marks and bite marks and here's some hair. Because bears love to get up and use those spiky parts to itch their backs because they have big um, heavy coats and things like that. Bears also bite trees. So if you can imagine that there's a tree behind me, the bear will go up and use just its canines on one side and grab hold of that tree and then pull out. Um, again, we're not entirely sure why they're doing it. It's certainly a form of communication. It tends to be the males, um, but you can see these are the incisors right here and the bear bites it and then pulls out. Um, Bears also use trees as babysitter trees and it's the cutest thing ever if you ever see this. So when a mom comes out of her den, she's starving. She's not eaten um, for months and months. She has given, and not only has she not eaten or drinking anything for months and months, um, she is given birth and these cubs are actually eating off of her during that time. So when she emerges from her den, she is on the move and needs to eat, but she's got these two very, very vulnerable little, like they're tiny, they're, I don't know, a couple pounds, right? Um, and she can't have them trailing after her and focus on eating. And so she sends them up trees. And you'll hear her, and I've, I've heard this a couple times, she'll like slap the bottom of a tree and the, bear, the little baby bears shoot up the tree, hang out in the tree while she's feeding. And then when she's ready for them to come back down, she hits the bottom of the tree and down they come. Um, and again, in different regions, they use different trees as babysitter trees, but it's, it's exceptional if you ever get a chance to see them. You're just like, oh. There's so much beautiful culture that we don't know about animals. Bears love telephone poles. Um, again, you can see in this big picture, it's a, it's a startling feature on an otherwise um, pretty uniform grassland. And so you, those kind of big features that stand out are really important to wildlife. So bears will target telephone poles. Um, and telephone poles are often covered with creosote, which is really scented. So they will go and they will bite these telephone poles to release the scent of the creosote, and it's also um, a visual stimulus for them. Again, here's my friend Lisa, and she's showing how tall this bear is. Lisa's about 5'8", um, and this is where the bear was biting. So this is a tall bear, um, standing on its hind legs, fully erect, biting the um, telephone pole. So we do have some big bears in Sonoma County, exciting. Um, den sites can be very, very elaborate, dug out, um, especially if the mom is about to give birth, you know, she wants to get in there and be hidden, but they could also just be crevices under trees or, you know, sometimes they're even open to the air. Um, and often bears just make day beds. So this is a day bed. Um, this is a grizzly day bed, but you'll see, you know, it's pressed down. They're very dish-like and there's lots of scat around the day beds. I just um, really appreciated this quote. It's from a book called The Fish in the Forest, which is predominantly about salmon. But I really love that intersection of bears and salmon. And given that we are in Sonoma County, which is part of Salmon Nation and um, used to have enormous uh, salmon populations as well as grizzly populations, the relationship between salmon and bear, it would feel neglectful not to talk about it. So I want to just kind of drop into this um, idea of the anadromous nutrient cycle. Anadromy being that you're born in freshwater, you go off and spend most of your life in salt 
water and then you come back to fresh water to spawn. And then depending on what species you are, and um, if you are like in our watershed, a Chinook or a Coho, you would die after you spawn. If you're a steelhead, which is also an adrenus, you may be able to spawn three, four times before you die. But what happens is there's this huge influx of protein and fat that comes into a system and the bears are there to grab it. Um, and you know, there's that kind of uh, proverbial word, does a bear shit in the woods? Yes, they do, and they do a lot, but only after they've eaten all of these incredible nutrients um, and in this case, they're salmon nutrients. And so a bear um, will, because there's so many salmon there, and these photos are from up in Tahoe where the Kokanee come out of Lake Tahoe and spawn in some of the tributaries. They'll grab the salmon, um, they eat just the heads predominantly because the heads have a lot of fat in them, and they'll leave the rest of the salmon there. And then everybody comes in, the osprey, the eagles, the fox, the coyote, the skunks, the raccoons. And so those nutrients are distributed um, across the wildlife network, but also that bear who's just eaten a lot of food goes for miles away from the river and, um, you know, defecates, and then those nutrients from the salmon go into the soil. And in that book, The Fish in the Forest, Gail Stokes talks about how there were trees that were cored in Idaho, you know, what is that, 800 miles, um, depending on where you are, 500 miles, from the ocean. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, so you're a good long distance from the ocean and they cored trees and in those tree cores they found marine isotopes from the scat being distributed by the bears carried to the forest by the salmon. And so there's this really incredible dynamic relationship between the forest, the bears, and um, the fish. And we can't deny that there's so many things that we don't know. And when you remove just one little piece from the web, you you can lose really precious nutrients and, and vital properties that you need. Oops, let me sit around. I also um, really want to kind of tap into this reality that if you have ancestors from North America or the Northern Hemisphere, most likely somewhere in your ancestry, people um, in your life, maybe thousands, of years ago, it could just be yesterday, depending on your background, you probably had relationships with bears. And um, people have been living with bears in the Northern Hemisphere for as long as humans have been here. Um, and we have learned a tremendous amount from them. We have learned what foods to eat, what medicines to use. And um, there are many, many, many stories of shape shifting between bears and humans. One of the oldest oral um, stories passed down that comes comes to us um, from Eurasia is 35,000 years old and it's called the Great Bear Mother. And so just to really acknowledge that humans and bears are very, very tightly intertwined um, and they have taught us a lot. Here is a picture of a black bear digging for roots and over on our right is a young Yurok woman digging for osha root. Um, and I love to say this and just acknowledge that in this very strange time of COVID, um, the bears have taught us a lot of medicines, and in this case, osha root is really good for the lungs, and it's active at bringing things forward, and it's an antiviral. So um, we have learned a lot from the bears, and I continue to learn a lot from the bears. What many people don't understand is a lot of our language comes from that bear lore. There's a really beautiful book. It's been in my office. Yeah, this is an amazing book called covers torn called the sacred pop and it goes into a lot of what I'm talking about of this um, ancestry and culture that has stemmed from our relationship with bears and almost any word that has that sound er in it comes from that um, sound of bear because if you follow language back that was a lot of the words that were used for bears so ursa major ursa minor are tourists and even the word like bird or bairn or even the word word all stems from a relationship with, with um, bears. And, you know, so that's a little bit more analytical, but all across the Northern Hemisphere and almost every culture that lived closely with bears, there were bear initiation rites and ceremonies and dances and celebrations. Um, and while some of them have gone deep underground or have been oppressed, 
um, there are still quite a few bear dances and ceremonies that are still going on. And um, here's just an example of what's going on in North America. Over on your left is this idea of, um, not this idea, it is the uh, Shumash bear dance. I've been invited to the Shumash bear dance and it is an exceptional thing to see these bear men and healers um, transform and become bears for the sake of healing certainly individual people, but also healing land and the landscape. Uh, in the center is a bear mask from the Haida, and there were big bear dances where these masks were worn, and again, the bear was imbibed for healing. And on our right is an Inuit sculpture of the dancing polar bear and the celebration and the dance for life. And um, because bears, they go deep underground in winter in this kind of really dormant, cold time, and yet they merge, and then mothers emerge. Not only do they come back to life, but they come back to life with cubs. So there's a lot of um, relationship of bears in rebirth and regeneration. And certainly, um, I know I'm, we're even experiencing it in Sonoma County as we're seeing this kind of re-emergence of bears here. This is um, the, I believe this is an Ainu bear celebration, and this is in Japan of the Ainu culture. Um, I'm not gonna, just because of time, I'm not gonna go into it too much, but there are some amazing articles out right now of this resurgence of the Ainu culture coming back um, with the bear celebrations. And Korea had a really deep bear relationship and they believe all of their people stemmed um, from a woman who was able to shape shift and transform from bear and back to bear. So back to this idea of bear sightings becoming the norm in Sonoma County. So they are here, um, and as I started to watch and we started to realize that our population was going up and that there were becoming more and more sightings and observations, um, myself and several others got together and we were like, well, what are we going to do about this? Because we did not want Sonoma County to become kind of a model like um, Tahoe or Yosemite where our bears were either getting poached or killed with depredation permits, or we're really becoming a nuisance, and we certainly didn't want to have to electrify our doors and windows like Tahoe does. So we got together um, with the purpose of rebuilding a bear culture and teaching people how to live with bears and to start learning more about bears. So here are the kind of collaborating partners, and I always really want to honor the bears are part of our collaborators. We're learning a lot about them, and the fact that they're here um, makes them integral to our group. Um, and I'll let you read this list. Um, we do have Kashaya Pomo Tribe. The California Indian Museum and Cultural Center is hoping to join us. Um, I also want to note that Recology, who does all of the trash pickup for Sonoma County, um, with the exception of Santa Rosa, is on board and really working with us to make sure that they're, we are doing everything we can to keep our trash um, in a good way so that the bears don't become dependent and habituated. And certainly there's Pepperwood, Sonoma Ecology Center, Regional Parks, State Parks, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Sonoma Land Trust, Napa Land Trust, Wildlife Rescue, and then individual landowners. We have um, ranchers, vineyard owners, um, hunters that are part of this collaborative. And I, I feel just so honored and privileged to be part of a really dynamic group where people come together for curiosity and, and a willingness to set their egos aside to really embrace this kind of new phenomena that's happening. So um, kind of, I love this picture, so it's in there twice. Breck Parkman is also part of the collaborative and he is the um, California State retired archeologist. And one of the things is that we have kind of adopted as one of our missions for the North Bay Bear Collaborative is we want to rebuild a bear culture in Sonoma County to remember how to be good stewards, certainly of the land and of these bears, but also to remember that we can live with them and how humans have lived with them for a long time. So that's a big mission of ours. So bears are in our neighborhoods and I just want to spend a little bit of time and being like, what do we do? And I, I put these pictures in there because they were set to me and, and the woman said, you know, I have this water barrel out there and I keep water in it for the dog but when I go out it's always half full and I, I can't imagine that it's evaporating that quickly and then one day she was looking through a window and there was this bear sitting in the bathtub and the water would overflow because the bear was so great so they are here they're opportunists and they like pleasure they play they're hilarious and they're incredibly intelligent and um, so here's just a 
quick slide about California Fish and Wildlife and what they have to do if you call them. So if you call California Fish and Wildlife and you say, I have a nuisance bear and um, I don't feel safe, they will hopefully try and help you um, to become safe and do appropriate things. But as soon as you ask for that bear to be removed, it can be killed at any time without a permit by California Fish and Wildlife. So as soon as you call Fish and Wildlife, you've kind of initiated this um, uh, snowball effect of how the bear has to be treated. So part of what we're looking at with the Bear Collaborative is um, how can we kind of offer another option other than um, having to kill the bear. So our best strategy is to not let the bears know that you have food. Because as soon as a bear knows that you have food, they're going to keep coming back. They're really intelligent. They're hungry. They're, um, they like to eat. And so that's number one. Like, keep your home really tight and neat. And that's great. That's for a lot of other wildlife. You know, you want to take care of your livestock for the mountain lions. You don't want raccoons eating your pet food. All of those things are really important. And it, it goes for the bears as well. And um, this is one of the best uh, websites that I have found. It's called bearsmart.com. We are not looking to reinvent what they have done. They have schematics on how to do like bear safe compost, how to set up electric fences, how to bear proof your um, trash cans, all of that. But really making sure that your trash is secure and that you don't leave it out overnight unsecure. And that's one of the biggest challenges. Bears love bird feeders. They're really creative and they're really strong. So being aware of how and where you're feeding the bears and when you're feeding the bears becomes really important. And some of these I just put in because the pictures are so good. Um, so don't put, keep food in, you know, in your car. I like to have snacks in my car. It's kind of a cool thing, but the bears will get in there and they can open up doors. They know how to, um, Pry things open and I always feel for this bear because I think the person got really scared and like slapped the doors closed and then the bear was trapped in the car and I was like oh I'm sorry bear. So keep your car food free. Feed your pets indoors. That goes for lots of wildlife, certainly not just bears. And um, grills. Bears have this incredible nose and we all know how good a barbecue smells. So just cleaning your grill after each use becomes really important. Um, bears like food. And as I said, the bearsmart.com, they have how to bear proof your compost. There's lots of ways. You can be really elaborate like this one on the right, um, but they also have some really easy ways to you know, proof out your compost. And then these are a little bit more intense um, mediations, bear spray. I only use bear spray when I'm in grizzly country, um, but certainly if you have a nuisance bear that continues to come in and you're and the normal like banging your pots or spraying a hose and chasing the bear down is not um, scaring it away. Uh, bear spray will do the trick. There's also, you know, if you have a chicken coop and the bear is trying to get in, um, there are boards that you can buy, but you can also create them where you just put nails face up and bears have really sensitive bear naked feet. They don't want to walk on those things. An electric fence Fences and dogs are very, very effective. A bear um, has a very sensitive nose and they'll test that electric fence and get shocked and um, they're done. And it's the same, vineyard owners can use these orchard owners. And the thing is with like vineyards um, and orchards, it's seasonal. You don't even have to have the electric fence there all the time. The bears are there when the grapes are ripe, when the apples are ripe. So, um, we're hoping to help people learn how to put these electric fences up and take them down and maybe even have like a resource share so different people can help each other out. So uh, I just want to wrap up really quickly. Here is a picture of our county. And I was really startled. I grew up in LA County. And when I moved up here, I realized I had less open space to roam than I did in Los Angeles County. Los Angeles County has the largest national urban wildlife um, national park in the country. And Sonoma County, contrary to that, is about 85 to 95% privately owned. We have um, an amazing organization, the Open Space District, who is working really diligently to make sure that there's open space. Um, but nonetheless, a lot of our landscape is owned and went by lots of people. And when you couple that with population growth, um, this was an estimate from California Department of Finance, 
that by 2040, our population is going to grow 64%. That means that all of that private open space is going to be, um, that private space that seems unopened right now is going to become more and more crowded and the bears need a place to go. And what we're seeing increasingly are these kinds of incidences that are happening. And so um, my hope is that through kind of this talk and through the Bear Collaborative and any questions you might have, that we get um, a little bit more of this, where the bears are curious about us and we're really thankful for them, but then they turn around and they go back up into their wildlife spaces. So that's what we're working on really diligently. And uh, I just want to thank you for your time and watching this presentation. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Meg, and that was marvelous. And we're looking forward to the Q&A. Um, as reminded everybody, Megan's Q&A will be at 4.30 p.m. on Sunday, this Sunday, uh, June 7th. Uh, and the details will be available on Oakmont Sunday Symposium slash live. Uh, Megan, we will see you then. And thank you for a great presentation. Thank you, George. Okay. So...